Today we're standing in front of a, a Rockwell Delta uniplane. The only thing that's missing from this original machine is a sign here that used to say Rockwell Delta uniplane, but you can see we still have one tag. Now this guy was designed and uh, I believe by a Canadian machine designer for Rockwell and it was first marketed in 1966 or 67 and I don't know how long they made them. Um, they didn't change very much. There were a couple of versions but they're basically all the same machine really. And <clears throat> as you can see it has a rotary cutting head here that has some um, couple of different styles of cutters. It has four of these so-called roughing cutters, slicing cutters, and then it has four of these kind of raker cutters that have, um, um, the, these are supposed to be finishing cutters. And they, um, they work really well in, in certain situations that are of interest to instrument makers. And, uh, and, and, you know, if you made little boxes and stuff like that, you would love the, one of these things, too. So because these things are whizzing around and the, the, the cutting forces are down, so just like a bandsaw, they hold the work down on the table. So that's nice. That's, this was designed, um, I believe, I'm told, to um, make the workshops in junior high schools and high schools safer. So instead of having a jointer machine, um, they would have this machine. So this was supposed to be a safety invention. Um, it has a, a belt-driven uh, spindle that's attached to the, this outfeed table. In fact, there's, there's three tables, as you can see. There's, this is the infeed table that's adjusted by um, this calibrated dial here. Uh, it's in fr fractions of an inch. And then this is the first outfeed table, and that's the second outfeed table. So you can adjust this one for angle and, and twist and position. And this one is adjustable in and out for depth of cut. So whatever you set for depth of cut is, is what the cutters will take off of the material when you, when you get in there. So... As we, as we showed, this one was, um, it was bowed. These tables were bowed pretty badly so that it made a, a kind of a curved shape. And there was no way to adjust it properly so that it would, it would work well. And in order for it to work well, these tables when this is set for zero depth of cut, have to be all exactly the same plane. And so um, we, uh, we show how we remove the extra metal, the cast iron, from this surface and this surface with a variety of devious means, including scraping and sanding. Let me show you a little bit <coughs> about how iron is removed. Now, we've checked all over the place, as far as we, best we can, with this precision straight edge and a feeler gauge that's two thousandths of an inch thick. Now, we can see that this two thousandths gauge is moving up to here, which means that it's touching over here somewhere. Um, and we can continue to check it here. Um, Okay, so that's touching there. That's actually pretty good. And then one more check over here. And let me see. Yeah, all right. So, so this part of the table is a little bit low. We won't be cutting there at all. Um, and we'll have to, we'll have to uh, take some material off here. I've already measured and indicated. So this is our high spot right here. And I'm going to show you um, the basics of how this works. Now this is a, a scraper that I made for scraping cast iron. Uh, I soldered in a great big uh, solid tungsten carbide insert and uh, it's really important to keep this sharp. It's a scraping cut 
So it gets cut like this. So we have um, a negative rate condition. In other words, instead of the usual approach of a tool that has a, a positive rake that gets in and digs in underneath the material, this stuff is so hard to cut that we have to give it a negative rake. So if you can see, it's actually leaning forward away from the tool. And I'm going to quickly show you how I sharpen this tool. So this is a, a diamond wheel that goes nice and slow. And All right, so that feels really nice and sharp now. So this is ready to go to work. And the way, the way this works is you uh, just push on the iron and it comes off in little crumbs. You can see these, these little lines of iron dust here. And if you look down here, you can see a lot more iron dust that was scraped off. Um, so typical to go back and forth like that. So you get an X, Y pattern, or really an X pattern. here. Have to press pretty hard to get this to cut iron. Tough stuff. straight edge and two thousandths feel gauge. Okay, so we are a lot closer here with the removal of material right at the end of this table. This one's about the same. So we still need to take off material in here. And on top, oh, we did, we did some good. We we're moving out this way, which is the right direction. Um, oh, I should show you also that you can see light through tiny little place. Light will sneak through. So now when we look here, we see, we can see that there's light everywhere, everywhere except for right here at the end. So we still know that this, this is the offending area right here. And um, there's a lot of ways to check flatness. If you were scraping something that was super, super precision, you wouldn't use a straight edge, you'd use a reference surface and a kind of a transfer die. But for our purposes, this is gonna work fine. So I'm gonna go back in here with the scraper and try and take off some material 
right at the end of this table. This isn't particularly hard to do, but we do need patience. <laughs> because the material comes off so slowly that you have to go back, check, cut, check, cut, check, cut, over and over again. But it'll be worth it because this little, this little machine will make short work of chewing up exotic hardwoods or any kind of figured material. And you can see the little piles of cast iron we're getting. Okay, so one other way to, to help mark this and understand how we're doing is to use a board with sandpaper. Now this is a very flat, very flat piece of phenolic. It's a plastic that's laminated under tremendous heat and pressure. And here I'm gonna use it well, it does take off a little material, but that's not really why I'm using it here. I'm using it to help me make sure that the work I'm doing is correct. So this is going to show us some scratches. This is 80 grit silicon carbide paper, by the way. So it's going to show us some scratches, which we still have scratches here where I was scraping and quite a few here and here. Um, so I need to go back in and, and carry on in this area. I see it's still being scratched by the sandpaper. Anyhow, that's most of what's going on here. <laughs> I thought it might be interesting for some of you to see how a machine gets trued up by hand scraping. Now it's all within a thousandth or maybe uh, a thousandth and a half of being perfect. And um, we'll show you some, some of the th techniques that we did that. But anyhow, <laughs> here it is actually working. So obviously this is a dangerous thing over here. You don't want to get your hands anywhere near there. So you normally use push sticks. Um, the thing makes a lot of noise and it takes a while to get up to speed. And we're going to cut, we're going to cut this um, pretty rough piece of, um, of green heart. You can see this has bandsaw marks in it. Um, <clears throat> and this is a very, very hard and heavy piece of mahogany, uh, of, of green heart. Uh, and you can see that it's also ribbon stripe, so-called ribbon stripe figure, where there's, um, there's, there's lines that reflect back and forth because of the way the tree grows uh, in the tropics. They grow in spirals. They grow left for a while, then they grow right. Anyhow, we're going to turn the machine on, wait for it to come up to speed, take a couple of small cuts, and we'll have a look at what it does.
So on this very kind of nasty, difficult green heart, we got a pretty nice surface. Um, a tiny bit of cross grain terra here. Not bad though, not bad. And then on this piece of, um, of nice mahogany, Central American mahogany, we got a really nice cut. And um, you can see here's the bottom of the cut. And you can see that um, it did virtually no damage to this corner uh, as, it, as it went by. And the same thing on the green heart, really. I mean, you can see that the um, that it, it it didn't didn't damage the wood when it when it came came down on it to push the cutting edge down. That's because it's sharp as all get out <laughs> and adjusted to a fairly well. And anyway, so now this went from a kind of a um, doorstop to a pretty interesting machine that's going to solve a couple of problems. One thing that you can do with a machine like this that works really well is you can take um, a long piece of wood like this that you might use for a fingerboard. And um, because, because of the way it cuts across the grain, you don't have to force it against the table in order to keep it in the cut. So you can sort of just glide it along the table and it'll, it'll create um, a flat surface, even if the surface that you start out with is lumpy or it's, it's wound up um, or distorted in some other way. It's a really nice way to straighten out a goofy shaped piece of wood. Anyway, Rockwell Uniplane, not for the faint of heart, but a very useful tool in the shop all of a sudden.